good, but it feels funny. Feel funny about using the mic. Um, good evening. Let's go ahead and get started. Can I get a motion and a second to adopt our work session agenda, please? All right. All in favor, raise your right hand and say aye. 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 No opposed. So having um, motion passes unanim unanimously and I want to welcome all of our guests this evening. I know all of our board members are really excited to have everybody here. And um, Dr. Flack, I'd like to just turn it over to you now and we'll move forward with our presentation. Make sure this comes on. I know, and we've got, we've got presenters coming up here, so we're gonna be careful of our wires up here. We've already. We've already scoped it out ahead of time. <laughs> so while everybody's getting set, I want to say thank you for the opportunity for us to come and, and present tonight. Um, this is a project that everybody on the team is passionate about. Um, it's really our parent struggling readers team. Um, and, and it's uh, one of the teams that I just appreciate working with very much because it's, it's rare that you get an opportunity to have such a knowledgeable group of parents and teachers and administrators getting together to focus on really what's best for kids. And, and that's what the Struggling Readers team is all about. Uh, the focus of our team has really been about how to support those kids, how to move forward. And the, the takeaway that I had after just a short time with this group is, you know, at first we needed some time to kind of process what's been going on in the district. There was a little bit of time needed to vent. There was a little bit of time needed to heal. But after we got through that, it was clear that the group of parents, the teachers, everybody that was in the room, in particular the group of parents, they weren't interested about just their kids and supporting their kids. They were interested in making change for all of the kids in Lee Summit. And I've heard multiple times, this may not affect my student, but really this needs to change because this will affect students as we move forward. And so I appreciate the heart that these parents um, you know, come to this team with because it's really the heart of, you know, let's do what's right for kids and let's make sure that we're supporting all the students in our district. And so with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to some of our parents to start the presentation. We're going to kind of each of us have a, a part to play in this. I do want to thank Liz Punzo. She's one of our uh, reading specialists. She's here in case any questions come up from the reading specialist side of things. Ann Sticknoth, our elementary ELA curriculum specialist, is here to talk about Tier 1 if there are any questions that come up with Tier 1. But really the group is going to just kind of walk us through, talk a little bit about dyslexia and, and then what the team has done. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Trisha Carney and she's going to start the show here. I am not a parent of a struggling reader. I um, do have four kids, three in the district. Um, I teach secondary ELA at Lee Summit West High School, but I am also a dyslexia interventionist. I will save you the details of how I got there, um, but basically I did not get the education that I needed to help readers, and especially struggling readers when I was in college, so I went and sought it myself and um, became a certified academic language practitioner, so I do a lot of work with dyslexic students on my own. Um, I teach a grad class in the district, and um, it's just something that I'm passionate about. So. Hi, my name is Melissa Woody, and I um, am a mom of four learners in the district and also a teacher in the district. I come here today, um, is that where we're going into? No? Okay. Uh, with kind of what I say, like a trifecta. Um, I come as a struggling reader myself throughout education. Um, it was a big struggle, and to the point where, you know, you had heard enough of like, you'll get there, don't worry, you'll get there. And at the end of my education career, um, felt like I wasn't gonna get there and really kind of felt defeated by the time I was a senior. Um, went to college and discovered, you know what, I can't get there because others said I couldn't. And so I got there and decided that my passion was to become an educator, um, to help other struggling learners at the time. That was my goal and became an art teacher. 
Um, so here I am 18 years into teaching and um, have seen an overwhelming number of students in my classroom. Even though I'm an art teacher, we still read. And I've seen a lot of students struggle with reading, struggling with dissecting what they're reading and making sense of it. And so there I kind of had a bigger interest of helping struggling students. And then I had my own kids and noticed within my own children they struggled with reading just as I did. And the red flags kind of started popping up and I realized that I needed to help them but I needed to help others, a lot of others. My journey was not just within myself or within my community, it was within an, a big problem in our nation. So um, that is my story. I have a similar story to Melissa. Um, I too was a struggling reader, and sorry, it's a very emotional topic for me. Um, but I too was a struggling reader. I read on a seventh grade reading level my senior year of high school and didn't know it until I took the ACT. And one of my teachers was like, Meredith, you got a 27 in your science and reading, and you got a 15 in, or sorry, science and math, and you got a 15 in reading. I was like, uh huh. You should see my chemistry tests and how long they take. Um, so similar to Melissa, um, I also taught in the district for seven years. Um, but my little boy, Andrew, he was diagnosed in first grade. And with the experience that we had going through learning his diagnosis, then that was what was able to help me help students in my classroom and to see, hey, it doesn't have to be like this. You can, you know, learn to, you know, different strategies and things like that. Um, I would bring it up to parents and kind of, there was a stigma about not being able to have those conversations with parents, but I did it because it just seemed like the right thing to do. So my reason I am here is to help future families um, to have a different experience. Hi, my name is Allison Stevens, and I'm a former social studies teacher in the district. And um, I am part of this group because I have two children. Both of them are diagnosed um, dyslexic and dysgraphic. And my oldest is going into fifth grade, and my youngest is going into third grade. And you'll hear all about our journey in a little bit. But um, I just want to say this has been a pleasure of mine to work with these incredible individuals and their heart and passion to bring literacy to each and every student in this district. Um, hi, uh, my name is Alyssa Becho. I am a mom of three kids in the Lee Summit District. My oldest is dyslexic. My middle one is not. And my, my little one is still sort of to be determined. Um, uh, I was a, I, st I am an educator. I started my career here in Lee Summit. Then I was home with my kids for a little bit. And now I'm teaching in a different district. Um, and I just feel that my experience on both sides of the table sort of comes with a, a duty to advocate for those kids and um, make this path easier for the kids and also for the, the parents and teachers who all want the best for them. Okay, so we decided to show you this short video. Um, it kind of encapsulates everything about dyslexia and rather than us just talking at you and showing you a bunch of slides. I also like this video because it really sends positive messaging about dyslexia. It characterizes it as a neurodiversity rather than um, a disease or a disorder, which is something that the kids really need to hear. It's also a video that I like to share with parents and students when they're starting their journey with dyslexia because of its accessibility and because of its positive messaging. So it's is something that we can share with you um, if you wanted to share it with anybody if anybody was asking it's a it's a good place to start so do we have sound sorry how was that frustrating slow what were those sentences about they're actually a simulation of the experience of dyslexia designed to make you decode each word those with dyslexia experience that laborious pace every time they read. When most people think of dyslexia, 
they think of seeing letters and words backwards, like seeing B as D and vice versa. Or they might think people with dyslexia see saw as was. The truth is, people with dyslexia see things the same way as everyone else. Dyslexia is caused by a phonological processing problem, meaning people affected by it have trouble not with seeing language, but with manipulating it. For example, if you heard the word cat and then someone asked you, remove the C, what word would you have left? Cat. This can be difficult for those with dyslexia. Given a word in isolation like fantastic, students with dyslexia need to break the word into parts to read it. Fan, tas, tick. Time spent decoding makes it hard to keep up with peers and gain sufficient comprehension. Spelling words phonetically like S-T-I-K for stick and F-R-E-N-S for friends is also common. These difficulties are more widespread and varied than commonly imagined. Dyslexia affects up to one in five people. It occurs on a continuum. One person might have mild dyslexia, while the next person has a profound case of it. Dyslexia also runs in families. It's common to see one family member who has trouble spelling, while another family member has severe difficulty decoding even one-syllable words like catch. The continuum and distribution of dyslexia suggest a broader principle to bear in mind as we look at how the brains of those with dyslexia process language. Neurodiversity is the idea that because all our brains show differences in structure and function, we shouldn't be so quick to label every deviation from the norm as a pathological disorder or dismiss people living with these variations as defective. People with neurobiological variations like dyslexia, including such creative and inventive individuals as Picasso, Muhammad Ali, Whoopi Goldberg, Steven Spielberg, and Cher, clearly have every capacity to be brilliant and successful in life. So here's the special way the brains of those with dyslexia work. The brain is divided into two hemispheres. The left hemisphere is generally in charge of language and ultimately reading while the right typically handles spatial activities. FMRI studies have found that the brains of those with dyslexia rely more on the right hemisphere and frontal lobe than the brains of those without it. This means when they read a word, it takes a longer trip through their brain and can get delayed in the frontal lobe. Because of this neurobiological glitch, they read with more difficulty. But those with dyslexia can physically change their brain and improve their reading with an intensive multi-sensory intervention that breaks the language down and teaches the reader to decode based on syllable types and spelling rules, the brains of those with dyslexia begin using the left hemisphere more efficiently while reading, and their reading improves. The intervention works because it locates dyslexia appropriately as a functional variation in the brain, which naturally shows all sorts of variations from one person to another. Neurodiversity emphasizes this spectrum of brain function in all humans and suggests that to better understand the perspectives of those around us, we should try to not only see the world through their eyes, but understand it through their brains. If you want to achieve better results, make a great impression, and Okay, so quite a few people are actually dyslexic. Um, it's thought to be around 20%, even though only 4% of people are currently diagnosed. Um, I think this was this percentage was from Shaywitz's 2020 book. Hopefully, maybe that number is higher. I feel like it's um, dyslexia has definitely um, gotten a better rap <laughs> in the past few years, but. Um, so we were kind of crunching the numbers, and that could be approximately 3,600 students in this district. I think of it all the time. I think about my classroom. I think, okay, there's probably four or five kids, and I can usually pick out a couple of kids every year who um, are undiagnosed um, with some sort of reading issue, literacy issue. Um, one of the reasons why these numbers are so high is because reading is not a natural occurrence. It is something that has to be trained. And for some people, it just takes more explicit instruction. And that ba that's basically what dyslexia is. 
Um, so we just have to remember that speaking is something that is natural, but reading is something that is not. Um, and we might not be teaching those kids the way that they need to be taught. So I'm going to turn it over to Eric now, and I think he's going to talk about what it looks like in our district. And the first two are really what it, what it used to look like in a lot of districts. Um, you know, the history of dyslexia in R7, prior to 2018, dyslexia was treated as a medical condition. It was more of a, um, and it still has to be diagnosed by a physician, but once, once you know, a, a student was struggling with reading, you, you had to be kind of careful about what you said with regard to dyslexia. Um, and that's, then that's how the entire educational community dealt with dyslexia. Well, in 2018, House Bill 2379, kind of changed, changed the rules in the state. And it basically said districts need to start screening for dyslexia and we need to start providing at least two hours of professional learning to all teachers on what dyslexia is. And um, I can tell you that first year, the training didn't, didn't you know, look as great as it does now. Now we have some really good, um, high quality science of reading, um, science of, of uh, how the brain works, training for teachers, which is great. So since 2018, specific to, to Lee Summit, uh, we, in, we changed our core instructional program. Um, so we added collaborative classroom and as a reading resource for us for tier one, uh, which included being a reader, making meaning, and being a writer. And that also included our SIPs, which is our, our introductory um, uh, intervention resource that we use for kids. So, so first line of defense and, and supporting struggling readers. And then we also put together a struggling readers parent team. I'm going to talk about that here in just more in detail. Uh, we identified Wilson as an intensive intervention for, for students who needed that. Wilson's a two-year program, so that's for our students who have the most need. Um, and then we started focusing on integrated professional development and, in particular, letters training for our R7 educators. Started with a group of about 40 teachers, and then we're continuing with that next year. Uh, and letters is that science of reading intensive training, which, which um, you know, lasts about 60 hours throughout the year. So let's talk a little bit about the Struggling Readers Parent Team. So in, like, 2021, uh, so the team's been around for a little over two years. Uh, started getting lots of feedback from parents on, okay, so what resources are you using? Why are you using those resources? What, is, what does this mean for my kid in the classroom? So started getting lots of phone calls, lots of conversations. And we just decided, you know what, we need to put a team together of parents just to provide or, or, or give us an opportunity to, to get some input from parents. And um, I didn't realize what a blessing that would be, you know, and, and in retrospect, you know, kind of looking back on it, I thought, what am I doing here? You know, like I'm bringing all of these people in who are starting, you know, some, they're always very nice, but very adamant about here's what you're doing right, here's what you're doing wrong. And so when you bring a group of those people together, you kind of do it with a, with a sense of, okay, what's this going to look like? It has been the best thing that we could have ever done in the district. Um, so they provided us a lot of input into the resource that we selected. Um, and when we did that, we, we were very careful and said, you know, we're going we're gonna to go through the right process of selecting this, but we want to know what you're, what you're looking at as well. And then 21-22, once we started implementing that resource, um, you know, there, was a, there was a little sense of, okay, so now what? Now, now what do we do as a team? And so, you know, obviously we're going to monitor the resource that we've selected, but then the team, you know, said, well, there's a lot of other stuff that we can do. And so we sat and we brainstormed for um, probably about two meetings on here are all of the things that we want to do. And really that's, that's what our work has done. Um, last year we spent, you know, a couple of meetings brainstorming it and then it became a, okay, so we need to we meet every other week for about three months, was it? So it was quite a few meetings um, to kind of process through the work that we're doing. So we're excited about that. So before we go on and talk about other things, we're going to talk, have a, a little bit of a parent um, overview of some personal stories. So I briefly told you a little bit about my story a couple minutes ago, but to kind of advance on it, how I really got connected was because I was actually having to do a lot of background work as a parent to get help for my kids years ago. Um, and that ended up making me connect with all these wonderful people. Um, I realized that my um, current, who's going to be a ninth grader this year, was struggling. And I realized that when she was really in like second grade, and um, I kind of questioned, you know, is she getting it? 
where is she at? Test scores always kind of fall up and down. You know, that story again of like, oh, she'll get there. And then as she got older and became a sixth grader, I had an incoming kindergartner who had gone to Great Beginnings and was getting speech services. Came in with a speech, speech service um, IEP. And I saw the same repeated patterns in her learning. And then I started questioning, wait a minute, I might be six years late on my sixth grader, but it's not too late. Let's look into this. So I started getting them tutoring. In the meantime, my kindergartner was pulled from her IEP because she had met her goals. And that's where I really started questioning what our district was doing. Because I saw she still had a lot of goals. She still had a lot to learn. She still had 12 more years of education in front of her and that we can't stop when she's just in kindergarten before she's even been able to be capable of making all of the sounds of the speech service. So at that point, I started getting tutoring. It took me 18 months to get her back on an IEP. 18 months was a long, long time. It was a lot of money invested in tutoring, and that's when I started connecting with all these other moms, thinking, this isn't just me. This is all around. These are students that are in families that can't afford tutoring. That's why I didn't get tutoring when I was younger. We have a lot of need. We've got to do something about it. So now I have a ninth grader, an incoming fourth grader. Actually, she's a triplet, so that's where I was able to see the data, too. I have triplets, so I have a, three fourth graders now, and their, their you know, scores bounce all around, but there's one always stayed at the bottom. No matter how hard she tried, no matter what she did, her scores were always clearly, clearly different. So I get my own data pool with that. But that is part of my story of how I really started to dive into this group. Um, my oldest son is dyslexic, and um, the, our, our sort of um, voyage um, was in kindergarten. He had a, a little bit harder time um, learning how to read, but we weren't overly concerned. Um, his teacher even wrote an article that was published about um, a student of hers who, who had demonstrated so much grit in learning how to read. Um, and that, that was my baby. And he, he worked so hard, and by second grade, he was reading pretty darn well through sheer effort. Um, but we were still seeing enormous difficulties with writing and with spelling. Um, he was just like a deer in the headlights if you asked him to spell anything. And I started looking into, you know, there's something going on here. And I um, we went through, I researched a lot of things, and I, um, he was evaluated at Children's Mercy in second grade, and then again in fourth grade at Cockrell and McIntosh. Um, he was diagnosed with um, dyslexia and severe dyslexic dysgraphia. Um, and he received a uh, 504 at the end of fourth grade. Um, he will be going into sixth grade at East Trails this fall. He's very excited about that. But this whole process sort of led me to, to feel like um, you shouldn't have to have a mom with an education degree <laughs> to get the, the diagnosis and the services and the help um, to be able to read and write. Um, and, and at the same time, the teachers that work with these kiddos shouldn't have to have a dyslexic child in their house <laughs> to receive the, the professional education and the professional skills to be able to help them. Um, so I, sort of, I felt that, that I was um, well positioned to sort of bridge that gap for, for both of these groups, and that's what brought me to this team. My son, Andrew, will be going into fourth grade. I mentioned him a little bit earlier. Um, but our kind of journey started, he went into kindergarten. He is a bouncing boy and always had been, but he was my oldest and I thought he was perfect. He still is. Um, but there were issues from the get-go. Um, he goes to Richardson and it's 
such an amazing school. Um, but his kindergarten teacher saw it immediately um, and said, I will never forget these words, I'd love to see what his pediatrician has to say. And so reading between those lines and then receiving the screener letter and the screener phone call, hi, your son's been flagged for dyslexia. Cool. Now what? Who do I talk to? Um, OK. Um, is there anything you can tell me more about this? Um, no. Did you receive the letter? Yes, the letter said everything that you just said. So not much. So that led me, well, down a very long path um, of our own experience trying to um, find everything that he needed. He spent two and a half years in tutoring um, after school twice a week for an hour each time and in Blue Springs, so 20 minute drive there and back. Um, <laughs> he doesn't love the word remediation <laughs> at all. <laughs> uh, he, that's a four letter word for him. But that's why we're all here and I hope that you can see that each and every one of us has, like Dr. Flack said earlier, um, We've all had our bumps, and we've all had our time to heal a bit. Um, but there's so many more families out there that are going to experience what we've experienced, and we just want to do better for them. Thanks, Meredith. One of the things that we focus on on the team is really looking at our district's mission, which is preparing each student for success in life. And so if you think about each student, if you think about the one in five students who could potentially have dyslexia or on the spectrum of dyslexia um, and how important reading is, I mean, that's the critical piece here is that uh, reading is the linchpin for success in all of education. And so if you're not a proficient reader, it makes it really hard for you to be a proficient student and to be successful. And so you need to learn those strategies. And I think it's it's great that we hear these personal stories because it, it really drives home the idea that neurodiversity is, is in all of our students. I mean, it's, all of our students learn differently. I think about my mother, and she would tell you, I have four older sisters and an older brother, that we all are a little bit different. Um, she would probably say that a little bit differently than I did. But, <laughs> but there are differences. And so... Um, one of the things that I didn't tell you is who was on the team, and I, and I kind of neglected to say that, but we had, it was a large team of about 40 um, individuals. We had teachers on the team. We had several parents on the team. We had reading specialists. We had a curriculum specialist on the team. Uh, board members attended the meetings. Um, so it was, a, it was a, a very diverse team and a lot of um, people who are very passionate about this work. And so our goal after we processed through the, the resource side of things. We sat down, we started brainstorming all these things we could do, and we really kind of boiled it down to this statement. So when a parent learns it's possible that their child is a struggling reader and asks themselves, just like Meredith did, now what? The message is followed with, here are all the, le all the resources LSR7 can provide. Here's what we can do for your child, what LSR7 can do for your child. Here's how we're going to monitor your child's progress. And then in addition to that, like these parents have had to find on their own, what are the local resources and groups that help you get answers and the support that you need? Where can you find additional support? What are, what are some programs that are available for kids that are out there? Um, one of the things that was most meaningful to me is we brought in students during this time frame. And the feedback that we got from the parents afterwards was, my, my, my child was so you know, just taken back by the fact that there are other kids like, you know, because when, you, when you're the, that one kid that has to walk out of the classroom to go get reading support, it feels kind of awkward. You don't think everybody else, that there are many people like you. Um, and so understanding that um, neurodiversity is, is, is part of the game and, and, and there are a lot of other kids that, are, that, are, that learn like you and, and think like you. Um, okay, so the group work as we kind of process through that last question, that last statement, um, divided up into four different teams. Uh, really wanted to look at advocacy, and this is advocacy outside of R7. So, what, so because we have several educators on the team and even the parents on the team have backgrounds in education, one of the things that came up most was, you know, I didn't learn anything about reading in my school of ed. So I didn't have any class. I might have had a, you know, reading in the content area class, but I didn't have a, um, a really uh, science of, of learning, a science of reading program. So advocacy on that program, advocacy at the state level, advocacy with DESI and our legislators, um, and then providing R7 with feedback. 
Um, we wanted to hear what's working for you and what's not working for you. And so just having an opportunity to have a venue to come back and say, here's what it is. Uh, putting together resources for other parents, which is a, you know, if, if we're going to have this group of parents that get together and talk about and, and, and share resources, I have learned so much from these individuals because they'll come in and they'll say, have you read this book or have you looked at this thing? Um, most of them uh, come in with what I would equate to master's degrees in reading and really understanding all of this um, important work. Uh, and then support groups for students. So how do we how do we help our students who feel like they're the only kid out there that has to deal with this or that's struggling or, you know, when 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 you when you have a hard time reading and comprehending and understanding and taking tests, you feel like you're the only person in the world, and then and then you know you you feel like there's this big stigma to having dyslexia. We need to remove the stigma with dyslexia. And so I'm going to turn it over to I can't remember who I'm going to turn it. Ellie, am I turning it over to you? Okay. Allie, and she's going to talk about, we've kind of combined some of those groups together, so when we talk about them, we're going to combine them a little bit. All right. Um, <clears throat> I chose the parent feedback group because I've got a lot of feedback. <laughs> and uh, maybe too much sometimes, but, and I've sat in this room over the last uh, year and shed a lot of tears, and um, it's, like I said, it's just been an honor to be surrounded by um, parents and educators alike who are so passionate about helping kiddos like mine. And so I, I wrote my story out. Um, where are the tissues? Uh, and I'd like to share it now. And um, this is kind of my feedback, my husband and I's feedback of parents of dyslexic students in the district. So here I go. Um, so, uh, okay, this is how my husband and I came to the conclusion to have our son and daughter evaluated for dyslexia, and uh, both of those resulting in moderate to severe diagnoses. Our oldest had struggled memorizing his sight words in kindergarten, but scored proficient in reading on both his report cards and NWA tests until his winter screening of his second grade year. We had approached each of his K through three teachers about our minor concerns, um, but none of them were too worried about um, his, his reading until that previously mentioned winter NWA EA test came back his second grade year. He scored in the 10th percentile for his something about that 10th percentile um, for his uh, oral reading fluency um, and in the 99th percentile for his vocabulary which is a huge red flag for dyslexia um, uh, shortly after his results came back he began working with our elementary reading specialist he began working uh, in the tier two so he was pulled out of his classroom I think he met with her two to three times and then school went virtual. Virtual education for young, unremedi unremedi unremediated, can you tell I'm dyslexic? Dyslexia <laughs> runs in families. My father's diagnosed me and now my children. Um, uh, virtual education for young, unremediated dyslexic children is extremely challenging and quite honestly heartbreaking. I sat between my two children while they cried for a few months until we gave up. And I became their homeschool teacher. Things got better from there. Um, so uh, a friend of mine on Facebook had posted a lot about dyslexia and I was curious so I called her up and she set me on the path of getting a medical professional diagnosis or getting into a medical professional for a diagnosis. It took six months to get in, um, but my friend was wise to tell me not to wait for a diagnosis to begin remediation, to treat his learning difference as urgently, urgently as possible as young brains have more plasticity than older ones. So I immediately bought a recommended Orton Gillingham approved program and worked with him 30 minutes a day, five days a week. When school started back up, he still had not received his diagnosis, but we continued 
our at home, uh, the intensity of our at home remediation schedule while the school year was, uh, his, during his third year school year. Um, in October of that year, we finally received his diagnosis, which was moderate to severe dyslexia and severe dysgraphia. Honestly, it was a huge relief to us all and a huge boost to his confidence because he could officially let go of wondering if he was just not smart enough to be a good reader. He could and was learning to read. He just needed to be taught explicit phonics and decoding. By the spring of his third grade year, his NWA scores were, were well above average. In fact, his teacher let us know that he scored highest, he was the highest scorer in math for his grade level and the second highest in reading. So he went from the 10th to the second highest in one year of the science of reading instruction. In second grade, <clears throat> before we knew the outs and ins of dyslexia, our son had severe anxiety about going to school to the point of faking being sick to try to stay home. This was completely out of norm for our easy go, go lucky kid. Um, so of course we talked to him about what was going on. With tears in his eyes, he admitted he didn't want to go to school because that day they were reading aloud. And he felt like his reading partner was, could read really well and he could not read well. well. Something wrong with this mic, I don't know. Is, is it too fuzzy for you guys? All right. Okay, okay, uh, okay. All right, um, so let's see. Um, he didn't want to go to school. So, <clears throat> our hearts, of course, broke for our son. He was intelligent, and we wondered why he was struggling to catch on to reading. I wish more elementary teachers, especially K through three, were highly versed on warning signs of dyslexia. I believe our son's dyslexia could have been caught earlier and perhaps saved him of self-doubt and embarrassment, although many dyslexics are super compassionate humans, including my son, because of their struggles. Um, also, I wish he could have learned explicit phonics in kindergarten and decoding in first grade instead of worrying about memorizing 90 plus sight words. There are better ways to teach children how to read high frequency words that do not follow the phonetic rules we expect them to. Our daughter is two years younger than our son. She struggled to learn her ABCs while well in preschool, prompting us to give her an extra year of pre-K as she has a summer birthday. Once we learned about dyslexia, it was clear that she would need to be diagnosed as well. And so shortly after our son was diagnosed, she was too and began her re remediation in kindergarten. <clears throat> when, she, when she had her dyslexia evaluation, she scored in the first percentile for processing skills. Um, so we... we started her remediation again with me at home 30 minutes a day and five days a week. Her second grade fall NWEA scores led her to be evaluated for the AIM program and she was, accept she was accepted into that program. I think it is important for educators and parents and for the general public um, to know that dyslexia does not affect a person's IQ and many dyslexics are highly intelligent. They are creative, smart human beings who have so much to offer to this world. Thank you for listening to our story, for your time and your concern and willingness to serve our community and the children in it. Neither of our children qualify for any services in the district because they score so high now on their NWA scores. And so I will continue to teach them at home as their spelling is still horrendous. And I'm hoping that the district will one day have a spelling curriculum. Um, do you want me to talk about the feedback slide or is my testimony good enough? Well, I'm just gonna jump in. Okay, yeah, you tell me. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I wanted Allison to talk about that beca because she talked a lot about how the science of reading instruction how effective it was for her kids. And I actually worked with her kids um, this spring, and I can tell you how wonderful they are. Um, I'm not gonna say that they're atrocious spellers, but um, 
<laughs> but they are very competitive with each other, I will say that. Um, and they are wonderfully bright children, and she's done a wonderful job with them. Um, but like she said, the, it is so important, it is so important, the, the best thing we can do for these kids is to have highly trained teachers. And the teachers currently just are not learning that in their college programs. I mean, that's why I went and sought it out myself. I tried to get a master's of education with an emphasis in literacy. It didn't work. I even searched out a doctorate program in reading. There really weren't any reading classes in it. So I took myself through a very expensive um, Orton-Gillingham program that I was eventually certified to be a certified academic language practitioner because I was tired of not being able to help people who couldn't read. Um, so the best thing we can do is to train our teachers, and that research proves it, and that's why I have our quotes here. And so in our feedback group, that was what we wanted to do. We, wanted, we think we have some good programs now for Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3. I was on the literacy team that adopted Tier 3, but we want to make sure that they're implemented with fidelity, which means that our teachers have to know the principles behind them. And if they're not educated in the principles behind them, they might not be implementing them effectively, and that's where the letters training comes in. And so um, we were so happy that the board approved that, correct? Because that was one of the uh, proposals um, that we wanted. We wanted to get more letters training, and we're hoping to get all uh, K through three teachers. And so then now our focus shifts to secondary because it doesn't stop at K through three, right? That's the best place to identify and to work with students, but we, we know we haven't gotten them all, and I have a lot of them in secondary. And um, so some areas of growth, and this is what where our next steps are in secondary, is um, first of all, providing training for teachers to understand the importance of accommodations in uh, 504s and IEPs, um, find a more effective reading intervention model. Part of the problem is there's that, that stigma attached to getting pulled out for those one of your seven classes. Um, and sometimes it's not effective. A lot of times it's just working on comprehension. And as Allison said, her son, 99% vocabulary, a classic dyslexic child will usually have wonderful comprehension skills, but probably can't read what's in front of them. So we need a more effective reading intervention model for our older kiddos. Um, that's where that training for interventionist and um, identification process and more communication among teachers. I mean, like I said, and like Meredith said, Melissa said, we can see those kiddos in our class, um, but not everybody can. And honestly, when I see a kid and when I say something to their parent or to the counselor, a lot of times I'm shut down. You know, oh, well, they've done well in English classes before. I think they're fine. And we don't have a lot of testing on that level. Um, so we've done some I think we've done some good things and we're doing some good things at the elementary level, but we need to know that it doesn't stop there. So that is where we are in our group in the um, feedback, in the feedback, LSR7 feedback. So I think now we're turning to parent resources. So parent resources was the group that I chose from the get-go. It's a huge passion of mine just because of how we started um, with that now what question. So we, as a group, decided to create a website. We thought that would be the best way to distribute um, effectively the curated resources for not only parents. We started out being very parent-focused, um, but not only parents. There are um, resources on there for also students and educators um, with the help of several different types of people. Um, Liz Penzo is a reading specialist. She was exceptional in helping us figure out a list of like decodable books and games and articles and, and things like that um, specifically for our students. Um, but we will have the flowchart of the district process, which is changing this year, <laughs> um, but it will get there. Um, parent books, student books, audio books, um, audio textbooks. As a struggling reader, I would have loved an audio textbook. <laughs> that would have been a game changer. So having access to those um, websites, podcasts, TED Talks, uh, a list of therapists, a list of, um, like Trisha, certified tutors that you can contact and get remediation for your children. Um, 
again, like different apps that you can do, different tutoring um, resources and at-home strategies. There's so many things, but you don't know they're there until they're, you're presented with them. Alyssa and I will be putting together the glossary of, of terms just to help um, those families out as well. Um, and we'll continue to add additional resources as we, as we come across them. In addition to um, all of those resources on the website, just having inter informational meetings. Um, okay, now your kid's going through uh, the 504, or the IEP process. What's that gonna look like? What's it gonna result in? Um, how, <laughs> how do you come up with a list of accommodations? how to interpret the district assessments and the scores. I've, I've spent <laughs> time with Liz um, saying, okay, now explain this to me. What do these actually mean? These are gorgeous charts. What do they mean? Understanding RTI groups and when those kids are pulled out, what does that mean? Does this mean that like my kid, you know, never gonna, <laughs> never gonna read as good um, as the other kids around him or on grade level? Um, you just don't know until you're told. Current intervention curriculum, again, what Dr. Flack was talking about earlier with SIPS and Wilson, what exactly that is, how your child can be a part of those programs, um, and any other additional diagnosis. Um, my son has ADHD, um, like it's a staggering, like 66% of people with dyslexia also have ADHD, and the chaos that happens in our family every single day um, due to that portion of it. Um, the dysgraphia, dyscalculia, executive functioning deficits, um, all of those things and, and resources to support them. Um, we have some resources that have been compiled by um, the educational um, psychologists that worked with our group to help with parent-teacher conference tips both from the parent side of things and the teacher side of things. Often people don't know, you know what, what they can say, what they should say, what questions to ask, that kind of thing. So there's resources to help with that. Um, the educational psychologists are working on a mental health and community resource fair, which will include a lot of information about our group and what we've compiled so that people who need these resources can get these resources. Um, there, we are working on setting up parent-centered support groups. As you can see, there's been a lot of, of tears up here tonight. Um, there's, there's a lot of difficulty in being a parent of a kid who is different in any way. And we, we just want to make the job easier for the people coming after us. Um, um, we are um, working on creating a flyer to spread out district-wide, put it on Peach Jar, make it available so that there's just a QR code that parents can click on and get connected with these resources that we've compiled. And so that teachers, when they are asked, what do I do? You know, a lot of teachers don't know what to say. They, at least they can say, here's where you can find more information. I know a lot of us were, were told at the beginning, that the, the, the schools just didn't know what to tell us. Um, so now they have a, a place where they can um, hand out that information easily. And we're also working um, to get additional support for our students through groups, group resource. Okay, we've got lots of stuff that we're working on for parents. We've got stuff that we're working at the district level to encourage teachers. We also then went back and said, our, that session that we had with our students coming together and they all were, walked out and said, oh my gosh, they're like us. Like it was a sense of relief to them. So we're working on trying to put together student support groups at the elementary and secondary levels, social events for these students and families um, to get together and, and get to know each other and support each other. And then also helping with the training for teachers, understanding IEPs, 504 accommodations, um, so that they can better work with their students. So I get to wrap us up by talking about our 2022-23 plans 
Um, so this team, next year, obviously we're going to put that website of resources for, of, uh, for parents of struggling readers together. We're excited about that. One of the things that we wanted to do when we started dividing this up and having the brainstorming session was say, okay, what are some tangibles we can have um, at the end? Because we just don't want it to be a session where we come in and we talk about things, but then nothing ever gets done. And so um, they put that piece together. Uh, we're working on figuring out how to get that published and what that looks like. Struggling, struggling Readers Open House, so they talked about having an open house and an information meeting in the spring and the fall um, about the same time that parents would receive letters so we could have some open house meetings for the district to share what that might look like and for parents to be available with resources to say, you know, here's our group and here's some resources that you might need. Um, obviously, parent and, uh, and student support group meetings and socials that we talked about. And then the team itself will continue to meet not every other week, but uh, we'll meet <laughs> a couple of times next year um, in the in the fall and the spring to kind of continue. Because you can see, um, you put a lot of passionate, really smart people in the room. There's a lot of things that need to be done, and so that's the work that this team um, will do next year. And we look forward to working with this team for for quite some time. So lots of conversation about adding people to the team, and lots lots more to come. So um, with that, I think the next slide is questions or comments or thoughts from the board. So I will turn it back over to you all. I'm going to uh, start by saying um, um, you know, the statement was made that, um, as you can see, we've had a lot of tears. I want to begin by saying that it was also apparent that there's been a lot of work. And um, it is no secret, um, even when I was running for the seat in school board, uh, for a school board, um, that your kid's story is my story. And when I got to see all of the students together and to hear the things that they were saying, um, it reaffirmed and confirmed why I ran. Because equity and giving kids what they need is not about black and white. It's not about elementary, secondary. It's about meeting kids where they are so that they can truly succeed in life. Um, so continue the work. Um, I hope I'm not jumping the gun, President Campbell, but um, I know we had a survey as a board on what are some high priorities for us as a board that we wanna hear, we wanna know. Dyslexia was the highest, if it's not the highest, it was the second highest that was rated by this board. And I want to acknowledge that because I think that's important for you to know that while all of us may be, cannot attend a meeting or we have other things, that this is important. Because if a student can't read, if they can't write, it doesn't mean they can't be successful, because they can, but it takes a whole lot much more work to make it. And so, Dr. Slack, I appreciate you taking on this work. I appreciate you working with these families. Um, I'm gonna uh, just end by saying that I also, um, as a board member, heard that we have three former teachers, former. I don't wanna see that, and I don't wanna hear that. <laughs> because we need teachers that really care about reading and educating our kids. And so I'm asking that you just reconsider LSR 7. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to um, thank every single one of these parents who's here tonight and our staff members who have been so diligent in coming to the meetings. I've attended most of the meetings. Unfortunately, I wasn't at the one with the students. And that was, I, I, oh, I hate that I missed that one because I really wanted to see those kiddos and, and hear what they had to say. But um, and unless you were, I think Board Member Campbell and Sparks both went to some of those meetings too. And unless you were in the room with these parents and just worked alongside them and saw that passion that they have and that commitment, I mean, that just energized me. It really did. It energized me. Um, 
or a person, I mean, I, I wasn't a struggling reader, but my mom was that one of those remedial reading teachers in elementary school for all, the, all those years in Lee Summit. And, you know, and I, I heard her passion for kids and doing whatever she could to make sure those kids could read. And I think um, I love that fire, and um, I, just, I just hope that we will follow through with all of our steps. Um, I really do want us to advocate with those universities and get the teacher training programs to have the science of reading incorporated into each of those programs for every teacher out there. So ev it's a requirement, just like IEP, you know, your student and your IEP or whatever, that was a requirement, but that was so just, a, you know, just a cursory level. Uh, it needs to be, it needs to be a commitment, a firm commitment, and we still need to keep working on those universities and make that a requirement. But um, I see this as a fantastic start. You ladies put so much work into this, so much work, and I thank you each for that. And we're going to reap the benefits in the future because you did. Thank you. Other board members? Board member Forwin. First, I, I want to thank all of you for just coming up to speak today and sharing your story. I know that's... That's, that's difficult to put yourself in that vulnerable position, uh, but I, I think it's amazing how not only are you willing to speak about it, but you guys are taking action. Um, and so I, I love you know, just how you guys are advocating for not only your own students, but for the other students. And so I just want to applaud you for that. Um, but I have a, qu uh, a couple questions, if you guys don't mind. Um, okay, so one of you shared a story about pulling a kindergarten student from an IAP. Uh, because they met their goal. And I've heard other parents speak about this. Um, they often call it uh, like the wait and fail method. They say, you know, once your kid starts to improve, then they get pulled out of the system. So I'm just wondering if that is kind of one of the things that you guys have addressed yet. I didn't kind of hear that in, in the plan. Is that something that's kind of still being worked on or is that something you guys are talking about? You know, how do you, how do you uh, handle that when a kid starts to improve but isn't quite there yet? I think that's probably something that we'll work with our special edu education department to, to process through. We have not tackled that as a team just yet. We're really hoping that tier one, so the classroom teachers, will um, be versed and, and um, knowledgeable about the science of reading and incorporate that in tier one so at least they're they're um, getting reading instruction that meets their needs all the way through I mean through 12th grade in all in all subjects so we're we're, we're thinking about that from from this angle with the feedback group I mean if you looked at the if you look at the statistics if you have you know hopefully you don't have to have a lot of those 504s and IEPs if you're doing it right. If you looked at that in a, in a quality tier one uh, program, mm -hmm. you should have 80% of the kids met and dyslexia is um, a continuum. So you might have somebody in, in quality reading instruction that, that meets the needs of a lot of dyslexics is good for all kids. So if you are implementing a quality tier one program with fidelity, with a knowledgeable teacher, then um, you're gonna catch a lot of those kids. And then you might have to move some that are further on that continuum up to tier two, and then you're gonna get a lot more of it. And then you should only have a few left in the tier three. So, you know, I don't, I think that that question is definitely like Dr. Flax said, a special ed question and probably above our heads, but hope, you know, hopefully we can get it to where we align more with those statistics. Um, to add to that, I didn't, even though I was a teacher, work with IEPs all the time, I didn't know the parent side of it. I should have requested a more bulky IEP in the first run, but it wasn't until I got to Children's Mercy and got the full assessment of executive function, auditory processing, dyslexia, speech, and several other things. That's when then we were able to build a very bulky IEP that should have help hold her more accountable to meeting more goals. And just to kind of circle back, uh, the purpose of this team is really that communication and feedback and, and working. And so as a, as a 
parent work group, there are certain things that we can do and certain things we can't, but a lot of the, the benefit of the work of this team is making sure that that, that message is shared and so a lot of the work is after the teamwork is done, getting messages to individuals to say, this is some feedback that we received from our parents in this process, that type of thing. So to say, are we working on it? Maybe not specifically as a team, but we've certainly forwarded some of that information as we go forward, especially our I, uh, educational specialists, et cetera, who sit there and listen to that and then say, okay, let's go back and process through some of this. This isn't working right. Thank you. Can I ask just one more question? Sure. Okay, so if we have a parent who is questioning, you know, what's going on with their child and they haven't yet been assessed, kind of just from your guys' perspective, what do you think is the first step that a, a parent should take when they're trying to go through this process? That's, that's a good question, Meredith. I, I won't finish it because I know each and every single one of us could say something <laughs> here. Um, I would say start your own education in, and become that advocate for your child. Um, especially in the elementary level that we're at right now. We're working on all of these things and we have great plans, but they're not in place yet. And I would say start reading everything you can um, to help figure out what, how the level of severity that your child is, what all they have. Um, it, it might look like dyslexia, but as you can have heard tonight, there's so many other things that could also be paired with that is even harder to kind of deal with. Um, start learning yourself. Maybe have them find some people, right? Find a group. I know that Facebook is a great place, but find some people to help you filter through that information and give you the right kind of information, but some people who have gone through it too. I'll say also, just be that strong advocate. If you're a parent that wonders, is something wrong with the way my kid is functioning in school that's reducing their success, ask for as many tests as possible. It does pull them out of school, like classroom, but get, as, get those tests done so you can get that documentation started and start to understand where it is that your child is, is struggling. I would say um, don't wait. Um, often people will say, well, let's just wait and see. Maybe it'll click. Um, don't wait. If, if you have a dyslexic child, there are proven techniques that will help a dyslexic child. But if your child is not dyslexic, none of that is going to hurt them. <laughs> good instruction for dyslexic kids, as Trisha said earlier, is good for all kids. So if your kid is having a hard time, start now. Um, don't, don't wait around to see what happens. Um, get, get going. <laughs> I would also add to that, um, start with the classroom teacher. You know, have that conversation. I'm really seeing some learning challenges. What do you think? Have a conversation. Each of our buildings has a reading specialist. All of them have been trained in letters. Um, so they're very skilled in our, and not only in our tier one instruction, but in intervention. They can, they're a great place to start. Thank you so much. Great. Well, I, I'll, I'll keep it very brief, but I just want to say thank you, Dr. Flack, for leading the team, facilitating the team. Thank you to every parent, teacher, um, advocate that was a part of the team. This was a lot of hard work. And as board member Sparks shared, every one of our board members sees this as an important step for all of our students. That reading basis is the whole basis for learning. So um, definitely supportive of all of this hard work and just wanna say thank you. And the actions that we can all work and take are gonna do nothing but benefit all of our students. So thank you so much. And I have one more board member. Apologize. Um, I did want to mention that one of the things that you guys brought up that you're going to be doing is a flow chart for parents. I can't tell you how important that process actually is because identifying it you know, I'm on the, our website right now, and while we can find some information there, the actual process becomes cumbersome, not necessarily even because the district made it cumbersome. It's cumbersome from a state perspective as well. The whole process is cumbersome. So those kinds of flow charts and ways so that people can navigate what is essentially a very complex system is incredibly important. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. 
And with those thanks and kudos, um, oh, uh, we have one more board member Sparks. Sparks. I just wanna just acknowledge one more thing. Hopefully you all know that hopefully the board is gonna be approving audio books, a partnership with our libraries. And so that was another big win yes. um, for the work that you all are doing. Partnership for audio books with our so Sparks Reader Group. It's a renewal. It's our renewal for tonight. Renewal. It's renewal. Includes, I think now it includes magazines and some additional materials. It, yeah. <laughs> we'll work on it. It's on our list. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And just to speak t to what, what to do when you first are wondering, one, take the shame out of it. Um, there is hope, and this, and we, th we've got lots of examples to prove it. And I just want to thank you for listening and hearing and supporting us and our children and the children to come and Dr. Flack for hosting us. That was a great way to, to wrap us up. Thank you so much. All right, board members, so now we'll move um, up back upstairs for the remainder of our work session uh, so that we can get this room ready for a board meeting. Thank you again. Thank you.